Merci beaucoup, merci. Bonjour à tous. Mesdames et messieurs, l'Europe de la recherche est-elle à la hauteur des enjeux Formidable question, vous avez quatre heures. Europe of research. Nous, on va à 45 minutes aujourd'hui. Euh, Up to the challenge. Finalement, we only have 45 minutes, so it's a big question, but we have to see what, challenge, what are the challenges and where is this Europe of research? Is this Silicon Valley and the, do we have this capacity to create so much? We could have the Loire Valley uh, where before wine was exchanged for sheets, uh, savants for for research and innovation uh, in the centuries of kings, but we don't have to wait for the 21st century to launch big initiatives as the CERN created in 53 uh, shows. Today, the challenges have evolved towards end to end. Uh, expectations from prototype and fundamental research all the way to access to goods and services uh, through research. Our guests here are going to be able to represent several facets of this analysis. I'm going to start with Mark Ferguson, who is uh, with us remotely. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to speak in French as you have uh, simultaneous interpreting. You are uh, scientific advisor of the Irish government, and you are also chair of the advisory board at the European Commission for the European Innovation Council. I have got a very simple question for you, Professor. How do you see the strengths and weaknesses of this Europe of research today? So thank you for inviting me, and I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Um, uh, you asked me about European research. If you look at Europe compared to the United States or China, we do pretty well on research as measured by publications and citations, and we do pretty well on startups as measured by the number of new companies formed. But where Europe is lagging is the ability to grow those companies into major uh, employers, major creators of wealth, major producers of services. So the European Innovation Council is about addressing that challenge. It's about funding companies to start and scale. So we want to work with people. We want to crowd in finance. We want to work with national organizations, with European organizations. And we want to have companies in Europe grow and scale and address really important societal problems in health, in the climate, uh, in all of the challenges that we face. And I'm very optimistic that with this uh, stimulus, it's 10.1 billion euros, we can help to grow a European innovation ecosystem and companies that will rival all the other continents around the world. Merci beaucoup, professeur. Je me tourne à présent vers Stuart Thank Cole, you very much, professor. I'm turning now to Stuart Cole, uh, the uh, uh, chairman of Institut Pasteur. It's not just a symbol of European and French research, but also a, a world symbol uh, thanks to its universal network. What is your perception of European of research, considering the world competition and the ecosystem worldwide that is evolving? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I think it is very useful to have somebody on this panel who's worked in many European countries. I've uh, practiced research and uh, I've lectured in five countries and I've uh, practiced innovation in two countries. So I must say I've got a pretty good European experience. I also assessed institutions, uh, research institutions throughout the world, including in Ireland, by the way. And so I have good experience in this particular field too. What I can say regarding research in Europe is that Research is not short on talent. We have researchers who are brilliant, who are motivated, who are key, but they lack support. 
de moyens. The lack uh, means. La recherche est massivement sous-financée. Uh, research is underfunded, en, en France. especially uh, in France. Infrastructures um, are aging. Particularly France, and particularly in France, following 20 Et, um, years of underinvestment. And as Mark just mentioned, uh, all the parfois, discoveries uh, en, en Europe, are sometimes souvent, valued in Europe, but often and more and more they're valued abroad. Exemples, I can give you some examples. Uh, un, un, un example. I'll give you one, in fact. Uh, the sequencing technology la, la done by Illumina, the basic technology Europe, was discovered in Europe. The concept, the the fine-tuning was done here, but then the patents were exploited by big companies in the U.S., and they saw an opportunity, and they grabbed it. And so we have to align all the different elements in the value chain, and I must say that currently some uh, uh, links are missing. One of the problems, I believe, is the question of scientific careers in Europe, where we place too much importance on publication and impact factors and so on, to the detriment of risk-taking and uh, patent uh, registration and startup creation. And I think if we want to rival uh, the US and China, then we will have to take measures to encourage our young talents, and there are many of them, to, to take more risks, and we'll have to support them in that. Thank you very much. Bertrand Boucher, you're uh, the Managing Director of European Affairs at the Atomic Energy Commission. And uh, you know uh, Europe pretty well. Uh, the uh, CA is also part of the construction of the European space of research, and you have a Horizon 2020 uh, plan that the uh, Commissioner mentioned previously. Bertrand Boucher, could you tell us more about your vision and maybe your contribution of uh, the Atomic Energy Commission uh, in this? Well, thank you very much for your invitation. Maybe to to start answering the question could be to look where Europe was 20 years ago, in the, around the year 2000, uh, with diagnosis and an objective. The diagnosis was that Europe was dedicating less of its wealth in investing into research compared with the US, for instance, or Japan. And the, diagno the diagnosis was also that we were spending less and we were spending less efficiently. Uh, today, we have have 20, uh, uh, 27 member states. I can't remember how many it was uh, at that time, but we had so many uh, national policies plus the European program on top of uh, all the national programs. So the idea was to increase um, this investment to reach 3% of the European GDP dedicated to research and to improve coordination, synergies between the different national policies so that they could be a complemental, uh, complementary um, efforts. If you look at what's happening today, it's actually quite cruel uh, in terms of quantities because we haven't reached the 3%. It's increased a little bit, but basically we are uh, under-investing in R&D in Europe, and maybe the recovery uh, package, whether it's European or national, might give resources to that. To that. Uh, it might be encouraging, but on the qualitative side of things, I must say that things have made progress, especially thanks to the, um, the momentum of EU programs with um, public-private partnerships, with collaborative research between the different laboratories, and uh, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission is very much involved in this. 
And it's important for the challenges that we face, the digital, healthcare, uh, climate change. We can't tackle those with national solutions. The, the Europe is the first uh, circle, and that's how we can compare ourselves to the world. The difference be between the year 2000 is that we're not just rival from the US. China has really become a scientific power, an industrial power as well. And so, of course, we have to make even more efforts to, to catch up. Thank you very much. Philippe Aguillon, I'm very pleased to see you here. I'm not sure we have to introduce yourself. You are an economist, professor at the Collège de France, and specialist of the uh, innovation economy. How do you see this Europe of research? Well, uh, my uh, colleague said some excellent uh, points previously, so I obviously approve what you said. I think now we are really lagging behind uh, China and the US. If we carry on this way, Europe will disappear. It will be just China and the US. So Europe has to wake up. Firstly, we have to rethink Maastricht. All expenses are considered in the same way. When we look at the 3% deficit, it's absurd. We can't have uh, growth, research, innovation on the same level as uh, pension schemes. We have to look at how uh, public expenses are done. So we have to rethink Maastricht. When we negotiated the recovery package after uh, COVID, research was sacrificed. Every time we need to sacrifice something, we sacrifice research. That shows we're not serious. Look at negotiations last year. Research suffered from that. So we have to rethink Maastricht. Secondly, the industrial policy, we always had the vision in Europe that industrial policy was the opposite of competition policy, but we have a, a competition policy that is old, that is thinking market share, market definition. It's completely um, out now. We need to think that the innovation is important. If we want to encourage merger and acquisition, we have to look at future entry and future innovation. You mustn't just look at market shares. So we need to rethink uh, competition policies in this way. And for industrial uh, policies, uh, Couchetard Carrefour is something that we don't want anymore. You don't want uh, just a few national champions. So it needs to be top down, but also bottom up and uh, competitive for new projects. The example of Barda, we wouldn't be here without the Barda. The Barda is basically money coming from uh, the US government. They've got team leaders, and then you have very competitive projects. And so it's a modern industrial policy. And we don't have the equivalent of the Barda in Europe. We don't have the governance and the means. The Barda spent 12 billion last year. The European Commission plus the Investment Bank for Europe is 4 billion for COVID. It's three times less than what was spent on COVID by BADA. So we have to rethink ba Maastricht, the industrial policy and competition. Um, and we have to have DARPA in Europe in energy, digital and health, but with real governance. And for the moment, we really don't have that. Thank you. Thank you for, for this. Mark Ferguson. So we realized we have to change uh, gear, and you talked a lot about partnership, and if you had one measure that could really change things, and that would be a game changer, what would be important to create new ecosystems and lead to fluid cooperation between the different players? So I will answer that in two ways. First of all, I think we need to do everything we can to change the culture or get a new culture. Cutting edge research is completely compatible with founding a new company, growing that company, employing people, making money. So this idea that somehow industry and making money and being in a company is different from, for example, cutting edge academic research is not true. Those two things are synergistic and we need to encourage that culture. There are signs that it's it's uh, coming in, in Europe, but we need to do more. We need to have this much closer synergy. The second thing we need is money, money and good policy. And I hope that the European Innovation Council is a first step. It's not nearly enough, but it is the third pillar of uh, Horizon Europe. It is about innovation. It is 10 billion and we hope to leverage that at least five times to 50 billion. Higher risk. 
I'm very clear that there's a difference between a high risk and a stupid risk. We will but we will be taking higher risks, investing earlier, looking at research uh, that could have commercial potential, and many of those things will not work. And so Europe has to get comfortable with so-called failures. I don't think there are any ever, ever any failures in research and innovation because you always learn something, but many things don't work the way that you expect, and that's fine. If that's the case, let's just move on and do something else. And I am, I am optimistic. If you look at the European Innovation Council, we've been in pilot phase and we are now in full phase. We're getting about 4,000 applications per month. And the success rate is a single digit percentage. It's about 5%. And that's because the budget is inadequate. But it also tells you there's a huge volume of applications. And so by leveraging in other players, by using things like the seal of excellence, there is potential in Europe and we just need to harness that. We need to have the right culture, we need to have the right supports, and we need to have the right financing. And this is a first step. It's by no means all that's required, but I think it's a first step. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Bertrand Boucher, finalement, on Thank you very much, Bertrand Boucher. So you have to go from top down to bottom up and do it so smartly. The Atomic Energy Commission is not a small player in this field, but so it can also uh, have big projects and aggregate uh, young talents is through different projects. So there's a training center, I, I believe, uh, from all uh, the European research. Uh, do you have examples of what could really pull the uh, Europe of research uh, upward? Well, based on this problem of uh, academic research on the one hand and innovation on the other, I think what we think is that, yes, you need this continuity. You need to have knowledge uh, at the state of the art, and we need to be able to transform it into services and products that, that can be sold so that public investment in academic research ends up in being a means of industrial and industrializing and creating jobs in Europe. We've had some examples in the past where the investment we've made in R&D instead served the industry of our competitors. And at the CA, we think the chain throughout its entirety with this will of understanding the academic logics, and we want to be at the interface between the different players. And an important element in this ambition is that we need infrastructures, we need experimentation, on platforms for that. These are places where you do research at the best level, but it's also places where you attract industrial players who want to de-risk development before uh, before the implementation, they need to test ideas with people who manage the, who understand the technology. So today we need to invest in these uh, infrastructures that are probably more technological, whereas the building of programs in uh, national or European policies is that on the one hand you have support for academic research for a specific community, then you have support for innovation, for uh, startup development, industrial development and what we lack is the link between the two and so we need to act on the interface between the two players and create a virtuous ecosystems. Thank you very much. Stuart Cole, on the world of uh, health, uh, in the interview before this conversation, um, there was a European Center for uh, Health Research mentioned. We envy uh, the BATA. Um, how do you see this movement, and uh, how do you think this could help in what we seek? Yes, these are very good questions. I'm also a fan of BADA and the uh, agility that um, this structure offers. I understood that something similar would be launched in Europe. 
It's very mais distant, étant, is the comment of Mike. Mais étant européen et très modeste, but as a European, nous, very, we're very modest, we are not sure of ourselves, so it's going to be underdimensioned, it's going to lack ambition and uh, lack means, I imagine. Très, très anyway. I was very touched by something that I heard just before, risk, that you have to take risks. In Europe, it's not part of our culture. We are very um, risk averse. Uh, as uh, the British would say, Americans really like taking risks. But sometimes I wonder if it's because the banking system or the financial system in the US is, um, is ready for that. Because with Chapter 11, the individual is protected, but not necessarily their startup. And in Europe, we don't have this uh, safety net. And so I think that there are things to, to do in this sense. And probably, Philip, you have a, a point of view on this particular aspect, and my other colleagues too. Well, I was going to turn to Philip right now. But I would like to uh, talk about what Maria Gabrielle, the European Commissioner, said. She said a, European, a, a Europe of research with citizens at the, at the core. And then we talked about the youth that has to um, work in this sector, change their culture as well, change their ambition in order to face uh, the challenges properly. What do we have to apply on the youth, on the citizens, so that the culture we're calling for today can be here tomorrow. Well, I think it's very important because I think that um, the key word is, uh, uh, is to emancipate and to uh, push the new talents. We need to push young people to take risks. We need to push people to take risks in general and empower people. And I think we can help in this risk taking. I'm very pro the idea of what Denmark did. They, Denmark invented flexi safety on the job market. I would have liked uh, the unemployment benefits in France to be the same. If you lose your job, we give you 80% of your salary. We train you for a new job, but you have to accept the new job if you're offered a new job. So people take risks. You don't have, uh, you know, the uh, uh, lowering of the uh, job seekers allowance little by little. It's not, that doesn't happen then. And then young people have this autonomy idea in Denmark whether you're a student, an apprentice, you have 850 euros a month whereas because you work or because you are taking exams and you're succeeding. And I think all young people of 18 to 25 should have this autonomy uh, wage at Ecole Normale Supérieure. I had a salary. I think a lot of people who study do, but I think it, would be, it should be the case for all students who need this uh, idea of autonomy and empowering. And I think from uh, education from a tertiary education, you have to push young people, you have to help young people to have an education system that is also financial, that helps people. And I think that unfortunately, we don't help young people enough and we don't help young companies enough. I think in France, you have a, a, a loan that helps big companies. Uh, uh, the, the British uh, look at our loan research um, and they think we're crazy. It depends on the ratio with the R&D spending and the size of the company, which, is, which makes sense. So a lot of it goes to the small companies elsewhere. It's generally the small companies that do most innovation. In France, most of the, this credit goes to big companies and multinational because up until 100 million, you get 30 percent for R&D. But obviously, SMEs don't get to 100 million. So most of it goes to big companies. And we're using this uh, research uh, credit to uh, stop people relocating. But we could have a direct instrument to stop relocation. So this is the case in France. And innovation in France, I'll tell you the problem with innovation in France, it's that the policies in France, politicians have never gone to university. They've gone to ENA. They are part of the uh, Polytechnic School, which is a, a, an elite school, but they've never gone to university. But research is done at university. And so this is the only one who'd done something was Sarkozy. I never voted for him, by the way, but he wasn't from the ENA. He'd not gone to one of those uh, elitist schools. He knew that university was very important. And that's a shame for us, because the decision makers think that innovation policy is done with CAC 40 only, with just a 
few big companies. And they forget that every, everything that you described earlier, which is the system of innovation. Innovation is fundamental research first. And the ANR in France is miserable. The Germans have a lot more uh, money. They, have a, they put a lot more re money on, on fundamental research. So we underinvest in this. We don't have the DARPA and the BADA. We have a credit research uh, which is centered on big companies, which means that in France we haven't understood that it's the entire ecosystem and it's really empowering. We need to empower people. We need to help young people. I was in Boston in Harvard for 20 years ago. Uh, I used to see the French consuls in Boston. And uh, they said, you know what's our main job? To welcome uh, French startups uh, that come develop in France and come to the US to grow. And uh, this is what you were seeing. And we don't know how to do this at, uh, here. And last thing, uh, very often we do things uh, uh, with all 27 countries. I like that. But there's the veto and I want my money back attitude. I'm in favor of BADA, where you align on the maximum, not the minimum. Uh, the problem when you're 27 is that you align on the weaker uh, uh, point the one who wants to do less. Mark Ferguson, we talked about a number of French and European limitations. Do we have the means of our ambitions at European level? And should we continue with 27 countries in this way? Or should we uh, organize uh, to align on, on the maximum, as uh, uh, Philippe Aguillon was saying? So I think all of us have a job of work to do in every European country to convince the political system of how important research and innovation is. And we can do that by showing our relevance. And that was very clear, for example, during the pandemic uh, with the rapid development of diagnostic tests of vaccines and so on. I mean, science was the way out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Without science, we would still be in serious trouble. So we need to emphasize that. And we need to show that that's going to be very important for the future for societal challenges such as climate change, such as biodiversity, such as sustainability. These are all areas where we can do good for the planet, where we can create new companies, where we can create employment at the same time. So I think the second thing I'd like to say is there is movement. European Commission, they took the third pillar of Horizon Europe and made it an innovation pillar. And that is the European Innovation Council with a budget of about 10 billion euros. And there are three simple instruments in the European Innovation Council. And I hope that they will work well with national authorities. And I also hope that they will encourage national authorities uh, to, uh, to play along a similar line. Let me briefly explain them. The first is Pathfinder. This is like a European DARPA. This is about top-down, identifying really important topics, encouraging groups to come in, and it's about venture funding. They will have program managers. Those program managers will have the authority to stop projects, to divert funding, just in the same way that DARPA does. So this is a European flavor of DARPA. In DARPA, the program managers have a contract of one-year employment. This is to encourage them to really do a good job. In the commission, I've managed to make that three years. So these are people with real passion to make something happen during that time. The second instrument is transition. It's what it says on the tin. It's up to two million euros to transition a project from a research laboratory into a company. And the third instrument is accelerator. An accelerator is unique. It's blended finance. It's up to 2.5 million euros in a grant and up to 15 million euros equity. The first time the European Commission has taken equity, that's up to 17.5 million. If you know the US system, this is a bit like SBIR, only better, because SBIR does not take equity. And we want to invest with other people. So in the first six months of the European Innovation Council, for every one euro we have invested, three more euros have been invested by the private sector. We want to crowd in those private investors. My vision is in 10 years' time, we make ourselves redundant because the projects will be so good in Europe and the private investment around the world will look at that and we will not need to be there to catalyze it. We're a long way from that at the moment, but that's what we're planning to do. 
And there's a very, very high application rate. There's a very high bar for success. The application is simple. It's like a VC application. The first application is a three-minute YouTube video. How innovative is that? Then uh, following that screening, uh, there's a simple business plan. There's a face-to-face -face interview, just like with the European Research Council. And then there's investment. And the time from application to investment in the bank, if you're successful, should be less than six months. And we will take a high risk. We do not expect large numbers of these projects to work in the way in which the applicants have put forward. But some of them will work even better, and some of them won't. And that's fine, because that's how venture works. And in the first uh, year of the operation, there are in Europe now, uh, from the EIC, more than 100 companies that are worth more than 100 billion. There's one that's worth a billion, but there's more than... Uh, 100 that are worth more than 100 million. We need to grow and scale these really innovative companies. There's fantastic ideas. We need to show that, and we need to show it to the political system. We need to show this pent-up demand. Essentially, by not funding this and co-funding it nationally, you're not creating your economy, you're not creating wealth, and you're not solving society's problems. So this is an experiment. It's a new uh, instrument. Yes, we can do better. Yes, we need to do more. But I think if we can get national uh, uh, governments, national authorities to work with us and, uh, and the private sector particularly to crowd in investment, then we can begin to change the system. We need to understand that there's never been a better time in human existence to be alive in science. Science is fantastic. The number of discoveries, the ways in which they can be exploited, the rapid route, uh, route to the market, the great synergy between science, innovation, and commercial development. It's a fantastic time to be alive in this in system, and we just need to stimulate people to get with it. And lastly, my plea, more of us need to become politicians. There are too few politicians who've been part of this innovative journey. And if they were, then I think we might change things. Thank you very much. Bertrand Boucher, I was thinking you were talking about this Europe that needs to act together and to progress with its vision. Uh, Philippe Aillon is saying we should do things a bit more a la carte. I believe that uh, it, what's important, and you told me the preparation, is to avoid an aggregate and to go more towards a unique vision, not with 27 maybe, but to go towards this uh, unique vision, this ability to work together and not next to each other. Yes, absolutely. We can't do everything with 27 countries and uh, uh, with the same conditions for everyone. On the other hand, I do feel that uh, the EU is advancing in research. Uh, if you want, the EU budget for your research is 100 billion euro for seven years, but it only represents 5% of the research uh, spending of Europe uh, every year. So the uh, question is, what do we do with this money in order to uh, take uh, the to, to, to attract the rest and drag it behind us? And this is what we're doing now with this uh, European framework and the partnerships I was uh, mentioning earlier to organize co-fundings and alignment between uh, uh, Europe and a union of uh, member states. If you look at hydrogen, batteries, microelectronics, this is what it's all about. And it's all the more necessary, I think, uh, since uh, I believe that the in there's so much competition that we can't do it on our own. In the uh, health uh, domain, there's a lot to be done there as well. We can see that the questions of uh, health innovation are changing with the arrival of the digital uh, in uh, the field of health, in the health sector, things have to get moving and we have to create a convergence and that's what we try to do at CEA between digital competencies which are the basic metrics for all evolutions, high performance calculations, use of uh, 
AI, uh, of AI, etc. The issues of biology, the basic science of the living, and all the uh, autom automation like uh, diagnostic tools, robotics, etc. In order to suggest uh, other ways of uh, of uh, treating new solutions for patients, and we know we can't work on our own in isolation. We have to work with the stakeholders, universities, industries, uh, practitioners, patients, and at uh, um, we have to work at macro level. The state and the EU must work together in uh, wide scale programs, and we've seen that in the new program. There's a partnership called Initiative for Innovative medicine, which is uh, uh, along these lines. And uh, we try to find partners to head in that direction. Thank you very much, Stuart Cole. We've been uh, listening to uh, kind of appeals like uh, researchers from all uh, environments, please unite. You come from research in health. Uh, do you feel this uh, uh, request for a wider unity? unity between the environment of uh, health research and research in all other sectors in order to strengthen the European uh, capacity for innovation. Do you already have uh, networks, uh, uh, common programs with uh, sectors outside the, the uh, health and science uh, areas? Well, once again, very good questions and very pertinent points. Uh, well, I would say that if I'm at the head of the Pasteur Institute, it's because I was able to seize the funding system offered by the European Commission. There are very good tools, but you have to know how to use them. I'm very happy to learn that the system is getting lighter and becoming more user friendly, and that will encourage people to uh, take risks. And uh, this uh, risk-taking is what I would like to highlight once again as being extremely important. It's important to encourage people to get out of their comfort zone and to start to, to If I uh, seize one of the points mentioned by my uh, colleague from CA, uh, amongst the instruments offered by Europe over the uh, almost 15 years, I worked within uh, projects funded by uh, IMI, and it's a good example of uh, how you can do things in Europe. Because it's a good example uh, how the IME is a good way of merging uh, the industrial know-how and what you can do in education, plus uh, startup companies. And uh, uh, very often, startup companies and SMEs are the most uh, receptive uh, to innovation, like the big pharma, as, as the big pharma is always concerned about uh, the uh, share price and the bottom line, and not so much by uh, risk-taking and ventures. So if we can uh, um, seize the benefits of uh, the new system that the European Commission is setting up with these three pillars that have been mentioned, I believe it will be a very good starting point. But we'll have to have uh, the uh, uh, sustainable funds uh, and durable funds. Research is not done from one day to the other. You have to have continuity. Obviously, you have to respect some landmarks, but you must also think about uh, think over the long term, not the short term. If I may pick up on what Mark said, uh, science is great. Uh, and uh, the uh, response of the international research community and the uh, international industry to the COVID crisis, as uh, you underscored, uh, uh, is a testimony to that. As you said, uh, if we made it, it's thanks to science and 
and in my institutional speeches, I always say uh, that uh, it's a triumph for science because we've shown that if you give the means, the support, the encouragement, and the infrastructure, you can make it, you can make the difference and get the world out of a crisis, a pandemic crisis. Thank you very much for these uh, messages of hope. I believe that we can see the vision. Philippe Aguillon, do we have the means of our ambitions? I believe we have to give ourselves uh, the means. It's what I said about Maastricht. I believe we should get uh, rid of the Bundesbank policy now. And uh, we uh, must uh, feel that investing in science, investing in growth, means improving our possibility to reimburse our public debt. When you increase uh, your rate of growth, you increase your ability to pay back uh, public debt in the long term. So uh, spending money in science and innovation is not the same as spending money in uh, other sectors. So we have to take into account public debt, but uh, we must think that uh, investment in growth must have a separate position. And this is a new culture. As my colleague said, it's the venture culture the risk culture. If uh, you want to have a culture of risk, you must uh, have the right means. S uh, second chance. Why, is, why did Bart uh, work? Because uh, they were told, we're taking the risk. If you miss, never mind. Uh, but because Barda gave 12 billion. If Barda had given 2 billion, you couldn't have had the risk uh, culture in the US. So Europe has to get rid of the short uh, time um, uh, uh, look at the budget. Uh, you must invest much more if you want to be uh, there in the future. Otherwise, the world will be dominated by China and the U.S. So you have a language of truth. What should we expect uh, from companies? You've talked about public authorities, but what should we expect uh, from companies? Well, I believe a lot in the triangle uh, between uh, the triangle of companies uh, that innovate, the state and civil society. With the youngsters you mentioned uh, earlier on, the winning triangle is companies, uh, uh, the state and civil society. And why is civil society important? Because very often uh, the state can be captured uh, by uh, uh, large companies and do their policy. And this is what Biden is doing in the US. Biden is uh, making major reforms for uh, in competition. And now, in, uh, instead of having a power that will be only furthering uh, large companies, you have a new policy for competition, because it's important. Big companies are important, but they tend to innovate less and try to stop small companies. It's the Schumpeterian uh, dilemma. So you should uh, have a policy that will push uh, for new entries, youngsters, uh, new companies. The growth in the U.S. is uh, weighted down by the GAFAM. They have innovated a lot at one time, but now they're trying to prevent the others from innovating. So you must have a, a renewed competition policy and a much more ambitious uh, policy than we have in Europe. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So we note uh, that uh, at uh, 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 T plus 21 uh, years uh, since uh, the beginning of the century, we see that uh, Europe is still uh, spending less than the rest of the world. We still haven't bridged the gap. We're still under the 3% uh, spending. We can see that there's still an issue of means and infrastructures in Europe that have to be renewed, and we must invest in men and women, in human beings, to create an, uh, new careers and new prospects. I can see we're amount of building new systems, new cooperations with an aggregated Europe, or rather an allied Europe rather than an aggregated Europe. Uh, we have to understand the logic the grammar, create interfaces uh, with uh, fluid uh, uh, private sector as the right scale, go from prototypes to development, take risk, not be afraid of failing, uh, uh, 
emancipating. I believe that with this, we have the basis for a new ambition with a, a national basis and a European context and a world ambition so that research develops and faces to the challenge. Thank you very much, gentlemen.